Hi, I'm Dr. Matthew Joby. This is a part of a series I'm putting together called The Politics of Psychology. And this series is the result of having taught history and philosophy of psychology for nearly 20 years, uh, primarily at Rutgers University at Newark. Um, there were uh, certain ideas, uh, certain things that I thought uh, were important for students to to know about psychology. And um, these are ideas that aren't commonly discussed, and I, I haven't found uh, too much uh, of this uh, being brought to students' awareness in the classroom, so I thought that I'd put together a series called The Politics of Psychology, this aspect of psychology that's more about ambition, desire, and um, in-groups and out-groups, and I and the history of intellectual, uh, history of ideas, etc. So the politics of psychology today, what I'd like to talk with you about is something uh, that is a phenomenon I've, I've seen occur repeatedly in, um, in undergraduate education, particularly in psychology, and it's called textbookery. Uh, textbookery is a term uh, that you probably won't find too much information on. It's something that I discovered uh, in this book, The Story of Psychology of Thematic History, by uh, the late Professor Robert C. Bowles. Uh, I would have liked to have met uh, Dr. Bowles and, um, and uh, studied with him because he has written an incredible book, and I recommend this to all students of psychology. The book, as far as I know, is out of print, but you can find it online. And... Um, to give you an idea of this term textbookery, which I believe Dr. Bullis developed, this is the idea that um, the impact that textbooks have on education. Uh, Bullis uh, describes textbookery as this neat, concise, polished story that is presented in our textbooks, quite typically introduction textbooks, introduction to psychology textbooks, etc., and this neat story of how things are in our discipline, he said, is very misleading. This is what he calls textbookery. Uh, textbookery is this presentation, this idea that comes from reading only secondary and tertiary sources instead of primary source material. So when we teach a class and we have students uh, studying from a textbook, they're getting this kind of homogenized, sanitized view of the discipline uh, that is largely something that is repeated from textbook to textbook. So most publishers take the same approach in a certain period of time, and that approach is what is going to uh, appeal to the, the most people uh, in the most institutions because the goal is to have the textbook adopted, your textbook adopted. So it gives a nice, neat, consistent story that is often not true. So this is where the term textbookery comes from. Now, I'd like to turn you on to another resource, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong by James Lowen. I believe Dr. Lowen is a professor at the University of Vermont. In the introduction to this text, which is now available on archive.org for free, uh, Lowen really describes something that we can add and expand a, a really great description of textbookery. And this is the idea that inaccuracies are published maybe in one textbook. That textbook is then referenced as a resource for other textbooks that are written. So you have three different publishers, and the other publishers will model their textbooks on the material that's been most successful with their competitors. And so an idea that is presented in one textbook will become repeated in another publisher's textbook. Now, 10 years later, all textbooks are basically referencing one another rather than the primary source material. And an inaccuracy that may have been published in one textbook spreads like a virus, spreads through many textbooks until 10, 15, 20, years later, it becomes a truth, something that all students and professors go through a system and learn and just take for granted that this is true because all textbooks say this. 
Now this is a result from relying on secondary source materials, that is, books that are write, written about books. When you go back to the primary source material, you find that there are often inaccuracies being taught that we learn, and as this uh, Dr. Lowen talks about lies uh, that our teachers tell us, well, they're actually just inaccuracies because we're relying on secondary source materials. Um, what I w would like to uh, turn you on to is this slide, uh, Freud's Iceberg Theory. And I think this is a great example of um, what we call textbookery and what is described by Lowen in his book. Now back, I would say around 2009, 2010, um, a student came to me and asked me, Dr. Joby, where does Freud talk about the iceberg? And they wanted to cite it in a paper. And I said, well, that's a great question. So I began looking into this question. And what resulted was a blog post that I posted that then later was published, in, uh, about four years later, was published into Harry Whitaker's uh, course at, at Northern Michigan University, uh, Approaches to a History of Western Psychology. Now, I since have uh, deleted my blog and uh, don't do that anymore, but my original essay that was published in that 2014 textbook and that I've been teaching to students ever since, I can read to you here. It's published in my text, Musings on Buddhist Psychology, Intellectual History, Psychodynamic Theory, Media Psychology, and Existential Phenomenology. You can find this on Amazon. I'll put a link in the tab if you're interested. It's just a collection of my ideas and thoughts in psychology. So I'm going to read this essay to you. It's a short little essay on psychodynamic thought, the myth of Freud's iceberg model. About 10 years ago, I was heading to teach a class in introductions to psychology at a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania. As I walked past the social sciences office, I encountered a box of books marked free. Little did I know that the box contained an out of print gem Robert C. Bowles, The Story of Psychology, A Thematic History. The late Professor Bowles managed to present some of the most insightful and sensitive critical depictions of the history of psychology I have encountered. One of those concepts that Dr. Bowles described is called textbookery. One of the aspects of textbookery is a complicated phenomenon that results in myth-making, falsehood-taking, on the appearance of factual truth in textbooks and in the classroom. Recently, I found an example that hasn't yet been discussed outside the circles of uh, the specialists of psychoanalysts and historians of psychology. Now, it's, I'll make a comment that uh, this was written originally, as I said, back around 2009 or 2010, and at that point, it hadn't been discussed. After writing this blog post, it became a discussion in the APA history of um, psychology meetings. Uh, someone from that organization emailed me uh, to let me know about that. And since then, this is now becoming a, a, a more commonly known phenomenon. And it certainly was nothing new. Historians of psychology knew this, as did uh, people who studied psychoanalysis and dealt with primary source materials. The issue is that this myth, this falsehood, is continues to be repeated in our textbooks and in our Introduction to Psychology textbooks, misleading students. It is nearly impossible to find an Introduction to Psychology textbook without the well-known iceberg model of Sigmund Freud. In every textbook I have researched, the iceberg diagram was labeled as Freud's, and some quoted Freud as comparing the structure of the psyche to an iceberg. It would be difficult to find professor of psychology who does not know about Freud's iceberg model. The problem is that Freud never compared the psyche to an iceberg. Translator James Strachey compiled a topical index as well as an index of analogies in the standard edition of Complete Writings of Sigmund Freud. The word iceberg does not appear in that either. Scholars have searched the 24 volumes and cannot find the statement in any of Freud's writing. So where did it come from, and why has it become accepted truth that Freud said it? The quote seems to have originated with Freud's biographer, Ernest Jones. 
uh, the, in the text, The Life and Works of Sigmund Freud. In his work, Joan quotes Gustav Fechner as likening the soul to an iceberg, which he cites in a footnote to Fechner's 1860 Elements of Psychophysics, but not to attribute that quote to Freud. It seems that Jones was drawing a comparison between Fechner and Freud and using Fechner's analogy as an illustration of Freud's idea. In addition, the only diagrams that Freud provided in his texts are similar to the one reproduced in, um, in my original essay. And it has nothing to do with, a, with a, um, an iceberg. So how did the iceberg model come to be uh, printed, taught, and accepted as Freud's own? Dr. James Lowen, in Lies My Teacher Told Me, develops the idea of what Bowles described as t textbookery. The myth begins as an error or a misreading that appears in one textbook. After an entire generation of students learn this fact, they accept it and teach it to their students as verified information. Suddenly, the error becomes a social truth. Subsequent textbook authors typically consult successively published textbooks and models and include much of the same information without consulting primary sources. Authors who consult the old textbooks encounter the, quote, fact, end quote, that they learned from their professors who learned it from their textbooks, producing a self-sustaining circular model of fact-checking. In the case of Freud's iceberg, it seems that it was first mentioned in an American textbook in the early 1970s and quickly spread as publishers competed for the textbook markets. Today, every introduction to psychology textbook that I encountered all 15 published over the past decade included Freud's iceberg model. Whether or not Freud or Fechner developed the iceberg model might not be important to many in the field. However, it illustrates the problem with textbook and classroom homogenization. How accurate are the mass-produced textbooks that we hold as the authority for our arguments? So again, this um, little uh, presentation that I share with my students. I thought this would be uh, useful to um, individuals who are studying psychology and want to think more deeply. And uh, this is nothing new, but it's something that uh, an error that seems to continue to unfold. The iceberg model seems to originate with Gustav Fechner, and it is not Freud's iceberg model.